We have details coming up shortly. Do stay with us. And we first begin from the Northeast region, where an official of the National Health Insurance Scheme has been arrested in Yedi with ammunition bound for Tripone in the region where escalation of ethnic conflict has led to a curfew. Mohamed Dweshi, a district public relations officer for Tripone, was arrested by the Bureau of National Investigations operatives Sunday evening on board a Metro Mass Transit bus. The boxes of cartridges which were being transported from Tamale to the conflict zone were concealed under a seat in the bus that was being occupied by a police escort. The unnamed police officer was said to have told security personnel at the last barrier to Tripoli that the bus was cleaned, hence they should allow them free passage without any search. However, BNI operatives upon intelligence that contraband goods were being transported to the area insisted on searching the bus registered GR2026U. Initial search conducted revealed no such goods, but a thorough sweep of the bus led to the discovery of the boxes of cartridges which Dweshi was said to have claimed ownership of. Meanwhile, the Vice President, Dr. Baumia, and the Minister for the Interior, Ambos Derry, have arrived in the Saboba district of the northern region to acquaint themselves with happenings in the district. This follows the renewed clashes between Kokumbes and Anufos in Tripone in May, which has witnessed deaths and the loss of property. The two are accompanied by the Northern Regional Minister, Salifu Said, the Northeast Regional Minister, Solomon Bo, the Deputy Northern Regional Minister, John Binam, and the Savannah Regional Minister, Salifu Fubraima. The security team is made up of the Commander General of the Ghana Immigration Service, Kwame Techi, and the Deputy IGP, Opon Buinu. The team is expected to have community interactions with residents in the district and proceed to Tripone in the Northeast region. Let's speak to our correspondent Zubeda Ismail for more details. And Zubeda, there have been calls for residents to end the conflict, but to no avail. What is the Vice President and his team hoping his visit will do? Uh, yes, for sure. It is indeed having several calls from these two student factions to give peace a chance, and these calls have uh, they appeared not to have been heeded to. But then, uh, with this very recent call by the vice president, what is currently ongoing, uh, everybody is believing that once this is done, it's going to bring an end. Now, what will interest you to know that before the vice president spoke and called on these two factions to lay down their arms. The paramount chief of uh, Saboba, um, who is um, John Matia, actually revealed that there are plans ongoing for him to go and meet the residents of Tripoli so that they can discuss. And this is going to be the first time the two chiefs are going to get together and talk about issues of peace. And for this, I mean, this coming from the chiefs themselves, the vice president, he thinks it is the way to go. Probably other calls for them to see fire did not um, see them seizing fire because the two had not agreed. But for the first time, they have agreed to meet, and plans are ongoing for these two chiefs to meet and then discuss the way forward. And we are all hoping that um, after discussions between the two chiefs, they will see fire and peace will be restored to the area, for sure. Now, Zubeda, what is the current security situation on the ground? I didn't hear you. I was asking what the current security situation is on the ground. For the current situation and security situation, I must tell you that um, it, it's been calm since um, Friday, May 17th. Uh, that was when the French minister met me to together with leadership of the uh, and then the um, now, Zubeda. And it's been peaceful since then. There have not been any confrontations. And so, yes, security does not are here. But then I probably believe that they have a little work to do because for now, for about almost two weeks, we've been in confrontations. 
Now, Zubaida, before you go, what more is the police saying, especially with regards to the arrest of the NHIS official who was arrested for um, having cartridges on him? Well, we've lost Beda Esmail. He's still watching Middle Live from the News Hub and still on this situation. The Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Joseph Whittle, has called for an urgent approach to resolve the ongoing conflict between the Chokosis and Kokumbes in Triponi. He underscored the need for durable structures to eliminate endemic intercommunal conflicts in Ghana. He spoke to Nuan Falun. According to the Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Joseph Whittle, the Chetkwane conflict has become endemic and requires a long-term solution. He maintains, without a lasting solution, the intercommunal disturbances will continue. We should begin to appreciate that this is no longer an, an, a normal communal conflict. And we should begin to put in place durable structures for ensuring lasting peace in those communities. There are some particular areas who, who are always throwing up conflict. Mm -hmm. It means that it's a problem and that the solutions we have so far come up with have not been addressing the problem. Joseph Hueto explains the conflict undermines development in the area. When it leads to the suffering of citizens whose houses are touched indiscriminately, women and men Children are overnight becoming refugees in their own homes. On Monday, the police confirmed the death of one person following renewed clashes between Chokosis and Konkombes in Cherponi and Saboba in the northeast region. More than 5,000 people have been displaced since April. The Konkomba Chokosi clash over a piece of land started in May 2018. Let's now go to the Upper West region and police personnel manning Ghana's borders to Burkina Faso at Hamile on Sunday arrested a Burkina Bay with a loaded handgun at the Hamile Roman Catholic Church. The suspect, 55-year-old, was arrested at around 8 a.m. after members of the church raised an alarm about his suspicious behavior during church service. The arrest comes amid the increased threat of terror attacks at churches in the sub-region. Four persons were killed in an attack attack on a Catholic church in northern Burkina Faso late May, marking the latest in a string of assault on Christian places of worship. There have been fears that such attacks could spread to northern Ghana as some Burkina Bays migrate there in search of refuge. personnel man in Ghana's borders to Burkina Faso at Hamile in the Upper West region on Sunday arrested a Burkina Bay with a loaded handgun at the Hamile Roman Catholic Church. The suspect, a 55-year-old, was arrested at around 8 a.m. after members of the church raised alarm about his suspicious behavior during church service and the arrest comes amid the increased threat of terror attacks at churches in the sub-region and four persons were killed in an attack on a Catholic church in northern Burkina Faso late May, marking the latest in a string of assault on Christian places of worship. And we are trying very hard to get through to DSP Richard Dapila. He is the Jirapa Police Crime Officer to give us details about this. Thank you so much for joining us, DSP Richard Dapila. So, first of all, what more can you tell us about this man who has been arrested? I'm not doing well. I was asking, what else has the police gathered about this man who was arrested? Oh, we we're still in the back of the we are holding him for possession of uh, um, possession uh, weapons without weapons without a policy. Hmm. Can you give us more details about circumstances leading to his arrest? Oh, in fact, I thought only what we have heard uh, from the uh, from just a school. 
DSP, how is your outfit liaison with officials of the Ghana Immigration Service to ensure that persons coming into Ghana are screened thoroughly? You know, our borders are so porous at this time. The, the, borders, the borders are not very porous. You pass any angle and you enter. Otherwise, the immigration and all the security agencies they are very alert at the border. You know, recently, even brought in this. Uh, people cross from any angle and find themselves in the system. So we are doing our best under the circumstances to see how we can patrol all the areas and that's when the security agencies are on the ground. Should the public be alarmed as we've seen um, terror attacks in churches in Burkina Faso? Should we be alarmed? Hello, DSP. Well, well. I was asking if the public should be alarmed as we've witnessed terror attacks in ch some churches in Burkina Faso. They witnessed what, what? Terror attacks in some churches in Burkina Faso. Yeah, that is true. There have been some attacks at some point on security agencies around in Burkina Faso. That is true. Well, thank you very much for your time. We have been speaking to DSP Richard Dapila. He is the Jirapa Police Crime Officer. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. An ongoing study by Cocoa Board in Cocoa areas affected by illegal mining show a total of 8,766 hectares of farmlands were affected in 855 communities in four regions. The study also identified 77,601 farms owned by 11,000 and 239 farmers as those affected. This officials say amounts to the annual loss of 29 million cities in revenue to the state using 450 kilograms per hectare average benchmark. The devastating impact of illegal small-scale mining, popularly called Galamse, spread across many sectors of the economy. Critical among these is the cocoa sector which is the number one foreign exchange earner for Ghana. The ongoing study by the Cocoa Board is to assess the real damage to the sector and how to effectively reverse it. The study showed a total of 502 affected communities, 8,557 farmlands, 5,702 farmers, and 5,040 hectares in the western region were affected. 149 communities and 1,594 farmlands were affected in the Ashanti region, depriving 1,332 farmers on 2,662 hectares, while the eastern region so far recorded 240 communities, 1,088 farmlands, and 727 farmers on 1,063 hectares. We have lost 8,766 hectares 
of our cocoa to small scale mining. If you quantify it in terms of money, then one year, assuming each hectare is going to produce 450 kilos, we are losing 29 million Ghana cities in a year with regards to this hectare. And then we are not even looking at the livelihood of the farmers in these communities. Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ebenezer Odruowusu, lamented the continuous destruction of cocoa land and its impact on the country. If you are to increase our cocoa production, if you are to make the mark that we're supposed to make, how do we do that in the midst of all these nuisances? All our arable lands, gone. Is that the way we want to repair this, our country, for the future? Not until we get back and realize what we are losing, even apart from cocoa the very environment that we are losing. And I'm afraid we can't make any headway. Currently, government through CocoBot is initiating varying interventions to sanitize the sector for economic growth. The project is generously funded by the government of Japan and implemented in collaboration with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, CocoBot, University of Ghana and other partners. Japanese ambassador to Ghana, Chitomu Himeno, pledged his country's support for Ghana's efforts in revamping the cocoa sector. Uh, your friends in Japan are very happy to support this project. But this is uh, only our contribution to uh, work with our friends in Ghana. And this will be a Ghanaian project uh, in increasing over the period and not limited to the areas referred to. You're watching Middle Life from the News Hub. The Boku Central Member of Parliament, Mahama Yariga, in a letter has stated he is unable to honor the invitation of the special prosecutor to appear in court on June 4 because Parliament would be in session on the day of the invitation. In a letter addressed to Martin Amidu, Mahama Yariga stated he could appear in court any other day when Parliament is not sitting. The Boku Central Member of Parliament added the constitutional right of a Member of Parliament to to represent his or her constituents in Parliament and to participate in proceedings and votes will be abridged if an effort is made to compel that person to respond to an invitation that will take the person out of Parliament at a period when the House is sitting. The letter stated he is not enthused about abandoning his parliamentary duties in response to what he described as inappropriate timed invitation. Maha Mayarga stressed any conduct on the part of Martin Amidu to impede or obstruct his right to be in Parliament on June 4 and represent his people will amount to contempt of Parliament. Let's speak to Professor Henry Kwesi Prempe. He is the Executive Director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. Prof, thank you so much for your time. So, whose side is the law on, the Special Prosecutor or the Member of Parliament? Um, say it again. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't hear you. Uh... I was asking whose side is the law on, on the side of the Special Prosecutor or the Member of Parliament, Mahama Yariga? Well, um, the law says that, uh, of course, a member of parliament does have the right, uh, does have a, a right that is constitutionally respected to attend to the business of parliament. And to make that right effective, uh, the constitution grants members of parliament who are in the process of attending to the business of parliament certain immunities. Among them is that while a member of parliament is on their way to parliament in attendance in parliament or returning from parliament they may not be served any court process or, or be summoned uh, uh, to 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 appear uh, in court and, and stuff like that but if you read it carefully if you read the, the relevant provision carefully the, the, the framers of the Constitution are careful to limit that immunity so as not to grant members of Parliament essentially 
uh, an immunity from any legal process completely. Mm -hmm. So it says that that immunity applies only if that member is in the process of doing the business of parliament in three specific ways. On their way to parliament, in parliament, doing the business of parliament, and on their way out of parliament. And this is essentially a matter of respect, right? A matter of respect for the, the, the dignity of parliament as well as for the work of parliament. Now, if we want to read that to mean that as long as parliament is in session, that a member of parliament may not be made to answer a criminal process, then that actually undermines another important tenet of our constitution. Remember, our constitution also says that we're all equal before the law, that, you know, people have, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the, the state has the power, criminal, criminal power to prosecute. So we have to really read these things in harmony. And I think that what Article 117 and 118 uh, have, have tried to do is to balance these things in a way that should accord the necessary respect to parliament. I'm afraid that the kind of elastic reading that members of parliament have tried over the years to give to these provisions would essentially frustrate, frustrate the state, and for, for that matter, the prosecution of crimes, if those crimes, alleged crimes, involve members of parliament. And, and we do not want to create that kind of immunity in the system. So I think it's, it's uh, but for me, what is intriguing is all of this a uh, triangular exchange of correspondence over this issue. I do not know why this is a matter of the invitation of the special prosecutor. It should be a simple court order. The court has arranged, I mean, has scheduled an appearance for a certain person on June 4th, and that process is set. I don't know why it requires the, speak, uh, the special prosecutor to write a letter saying that you, should, you are invited to appear. It's not an invitation. It's a court summons. You know, so I don't understand all of this stuff about, you know, this triangular exchange of correspondence. You know, this is the law being enforced. Mm. And if you have any objections, you go to court and say, Your Honor, um, I, I am responding to the summons. However, see Article 118 or Article 117. I, I, I may not be, be asked to appear before this because of this and that and that. And then the court will just adjudicate on that particular motion. You know, but not to appear before the court at all. I think it's it's, it's not it's it, it's uh, it's a bit intriguing to me. Well, thank you very much for your time. And Professor Henry Kwesi Prempe is the executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. He's still watching Media Life from the News Hub. Now, the Okai Kwesalf Submetro has directed drivers of all vehicles parked under the Kaneshi footbridge to move or risk being towed away. They congesting the footbridge area. Sub-Metro Director Samuel Momo says the assembly is on a sustainable drive to clear the area of all cars and hawkers who have hijacked the area. You would appreciate the fact that it takes a lot of time moving from the Obotebi Lamte circle towards the first light area as a result of these activities. They've been able to clear a little bit of people who have been selling on the pavement. The exercise is ongoing, you can see from the pictures. The road is a bit clear though. As to how this will be done going forward to be sustainable is another issue because it's not the first time this has been done. We have seen it at Circle, we've seen it in other parts of the capital. Samuel Moore, who is the metro director for the Okaikwe South Sub Metro. Samuel, uh, what has necessitated uh, this decongestion that you're doing? Well, um, as you can see, there is now a free flow of pedestrians on this footbridge. Uh, what it means is that this footbridge is meant for pedestrians to cross only, but not to put stalls, stalls, etc., on the bridge. Now, there are reports that the bridge is weakening and it's affecting the structures. So at Sub Metro, we cannot sit aloof to watch all this go on. I mean, especially with the president's vision of making Accra a cleaner city. Coupled with mayor's, you know, vision, we must move in. And with the help of the Kaneshi police, thankfully we have the blessing of the uh, divisional commander, who is very supportive of this exercise. 
And so, I mean, this is the reason we um, embarked on this decongestion. This is not the first time we are saying this. I mean, as a journalist, I have reported on this on several locations. Give me some assurance beyond just words that this will be sustainable. Well, I, like I said earlier, the divisional commander is in charge, is fully supportive of this exercise. And I can tell you that the new crop of leadership within Okaiku South Sub Metro, I mean, wouldn't sit and see all this indiscipline go on. The whole of this, you can see the buses all lined up. This is a no parking zone. Did your assembly give permits to these drivers who park along this stretch, which is a no parking zone? No, not at all. These buses found their ways here without our approval. And so if you came earlier, you would realize that we had towed some cars away, some buses away, and we are going to continue. We've issued notices and warnings to those buses to move in their own interest. If they don't do that, we will be compelled to tow them as well. Superintendent Sadongo is in charge of uh, this operation security-wise. Let me ask you, you, you are familiar with uh, petty thievery, pickpocketing and all others around this area, especially under the bridge and then on top of the bridge. What can you say uh, has been the level of security for commuters on this stretch when it comes to petty uh, theft and then robbery? We have in the past few months redirected our energies and efforts towards ensuring that petty thievery, petty thefts, pickpocketing, bag snatching, and etc. Uh, is reduced to the barest minimum. In so doing, we have used our community policing assistants, assigned them to strategic areas. We have also reassigned our patrol teams uh, to be more visible and to be proactive at areas where those uh, petty thefts occur. And so uh, I can tell you, although I don't have the figures off the top of my head, that these crimes have reduced drastically. And, and, and since uh, you are saying that it has reduced, uh, have you in any way made significant arrests and, so to speak, uh, prosecutions since you have redeployed your men in terms of community policing in the enclave? Well, the level of police efficiency is not measured by the number of arrests and prosecutions. It's actually the absence of crime. And so what we have done is our deployment has made it very difficult for criminals to ply their trade. The exercise of uh, the Okaikwe South Submetro indicates it's going to continue unabated until they see uh, the street very, very clear. We will, however, continue to monitor the situation. Komla Kluchev, TV3 News, Kanishi. Thank you very much, Kamala Kluche, for that update. Coming up is the MTN video report, and today, Godfred Kodane reports from Pungu in the Upper East region. This is a bridge. This bridge is linking Pungu Tekuru to the Navrongo town. This bridge is at the point of collapsing. I am calling on authorities and concerned citizens to come to our aid. If this bridge collapses, a gap will be created between the residents of Pungu Tekuru and the Navrongo town. Reporting from Pungu Tekuru, your citizen journalist, Kodane Goffred. Thank you very much, Godfred, for that update. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us.
In business this afternoon, the Bank of Ghana, in accordance with Section 1232 of Act 930, appointed Eric Nana Nipa, a director of Price Waterhouse Coopers Ghana Limited, as receiver for the purposes of winding down affairs of microfinance companies whose licenses were revoked. The main duties of the receiver will be to recover and maximize asset realizations for the benefit of creditors, including mainly depositors and distribute realizations in accordance with the relevant provisions of Act 930 to satisfy the indebtedness of these institutions to their body of creditors to the extent possible. Following his appointment, the receiver has commenced the process of taking control over these affected microfinance companies as part of the orderly winding up of operations of these institutions. An assessment of the state of affairs of these institutions to ascertain the types and values of assets as at the commencement of receivership will be completed within the next 10 days. So what is currently happening is that the receiver has served a notice and, and that this submission of proof of debt creditors will be required to submit their claims by completing a proof of debt form to be designed by the receiver. Now on validating and agreeing claims, the receiver will independently verify and reconcile the claims submitted by the creditors. On payment of depositors, payment to depositors with regard to that um, affected microfinance companies, the receiver will make payments to this class of creditors using funds provided by government for this purpose and payments to other creditors for the class of other creditors, excluding depositors, depending on the quantum and timing of asset realization and the receivership of the affected microfinance companies. Meanwhile, the central bank says it will move to clean up the savings and loan sector after it revoked the licenses of 347 microfinance institutions in the country. And 39 microcredit institutions have also had their licenses revoked. And earlier, the central bank governor, Dr. Ernest Addison, said a few savings and loans firms have shown signs of insolvency and will have to be liquidated, just as happened with the banks. To the Executive Secretary of the Microfinance Institutions Network, Trinibua Kodia, thank you so much for your time. So how are your members reacting to the closure of over 300 microfinance institutions by the Central Bank? Uh, thank you very much. And good afternoon to your viewers. I am the executive secretary for the Savings and Loans Association. All right, thanks for the correction. Yes. Um, as you rightly said, um, we are all aware of the reform process that the central bank um, is going through as far as the banking industry is concerned. And so each and every individual or institution ensures that they operate within the remit of the law and also ensure that the customer is fair. But of course, um, we are aware that one or two of them are also having some challenges in terms of liquidity. Mm. So to sum it up, um, we are preparing ourselves. We are making sure that we comply with regulations and we are making sure that um, Any time that the depositor comes that they need their money, they have access to it. Of course, everybody is aware that liquidity is a challenge um, uh, in the sector as of now because uh, the depositors are not bringing their deposits. The people who took the loans from these savings and loans companies are also not paying their loans. And... Um, Investors who did that to had uh, planned that they were going to invest in the sector are playing the wait and see attitude. And so it, it is a challenging moment, but we are very confident that 
uh, the sector will become stronger than before. You work closely with microfinance companies. Did you expect this huge number to be closed? Oh, of course no, because we have 38 savings and loans companies in Ghana. That is after June when GN uh, finished the transition or complete the transition. So let's see 37 savings and loans. And if even 10% uh, of them, um, that is not equal to the number of the microfinance. And so we do not expect um, a lot of the savings and loans companies. And of course, those even who have challenges are continuously putting in place measures to ensure that any challenge that they have um, is rectified. Now, the Bank of Ghana says that the savings and loans sector will be the next in the cleanup exercise. How prepared are you? Of course, it is expected. And the rationale for the action by the regulator is to ensure that depositors are confident in doing business with the institutions uh, who are running. And so as I said early on, the various institutions are continuously operating within compliance. And so I would say that the institutions are preparing themselves. But you know, of course, in such instances when the central bank, who is privileged to a whole lot of data beyond what even the institutions have, you cannot say that you are 100% prepared because you may not know certain things that Bank of Ghana may be relying on. If you um, had what some of the microfinance institutions were saying that they received their report from the central bank and they asked them to rectify some of their infractions, giving them end of June. And giving them end of June to rectify their issues and their license is revoked. And so you cannot say that I have fully prepared. And so what we will want to admonish uh, customers is that everybody should remain calm. Everybody who is doing business with any institution that Bank of Ghana has licensed, evidence has proved that their monies and deposits and everything. Well, we've lost Trinibua Kodia Bahe as the Executive Secretary of the Association of Savings and Loans. Then that's it for Midday Life. Thanks so much for your time. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon. Thank you.